Hello and welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers. Tonight we are in the book of Acts and if you'll get your Bibles, go to Acts 15 for a little review and we'll go as fast as we can because we want you to know all about what's going on in the book of Acts. And on my right is... I'm Gerald Winslow. I work at the Medical Center at Loma Linda University. And John Jones, the School of Religion at La Sierra University. John Brunt, the Azure Hills Adventist Church. Ivan Blazin, Loma Linda University School of Religion. And as you know, I'm Carolyn Thompson, and I'm going to ask my good friend, friend, John Brunt, there he is, John Brunt, <laughs> to give us a little review of uh, chapter 15 in the book of Acts. Well, chapter 15 is a very pivotal part yes. of the book of Acts because it is where the church comes together to make a decision. The question is, will Gentiles who have not been circumcised be able to come directly into the Christian church and be baptized, or do they have to become Jews first and be circumcised? Now, Paul and Barnabas had been ministering up in Antioch, and they had been baptizing Gentile Christians, but there was some objection to this. And according to Acts 15, there were some who had been members of the Pharisee party before they became Christians mm -hmm. who objected. Now, over in Galatians 2, Paul tells about the same incident, and he's not quite as uh, soft as Luke is. Okay. He says they are false brethren who secretly infiltrated their way in to spy out our freedom and make us slaves. Uh -oh. So uh, uh -oh. there's a lot of that going around. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> you don't have to guess what no. he thought about these people. Yeah. But it caused them to say, okay, let's get together, and we have what really is sure. the first church council here, where Paul and Barnabas come, and they go to Jerusalem from Antioch. It says up to Jerusalem. We would think of it as down because it's south on the map. But yeah. in the first century, you always went up to Jerusalem from any direction. Okay. And they went up to Jerusalem. They met there with the apostles and with James, the Lord's brother. And they discussed the question. And as we'll see when we get into the chapter, uh, Peter made a speech about what had happened. Remember, we studied back in Acts 10 and 11 Peter's vision and how he went to the home of Cornelius and the Holy Spirit was poured on Cornelius in yes. his household and they were Gentiles. And so Peter told about that and then finally James makes the decision okay. and he says that they will allow Gentiles to be baptized without being circumcised. They do specify some uh, provisions that they would like for the Gentiles to remember so as not to um, be offensive to Jewish brothers and sisters. And they write a letter back, and Paul and Barnabas take the letter, and they have two other people go along with the letter, Judas mm -hmm. and Silas. To make sure it gets there. Make sure that it gets there, and yeah. it's read, and it's for the people in the area yeah. of Syria. And um, the letter specifies the decision that they had made. But John... Why the big argument here? I know there was a difference of opinion. Because God had poured out His Spirit on these people. That's right. God had poured out His Spirit on Gentiles, as we yes. saw back in Acts 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who were there said, how can we withhold baptism because That's they received right. the Spirit? But these other people were saying, now wait a minute... Um, Other God people told meaning us these uh, Pharisees, one, yeah, okay. former Pharisees. Mm -hmm. um, they say, now wait a minute. We don't think the Spirit should go against what Scripture says. And Scripture was very clear that you were to circumcise your children, and if you were really going to come to God, you had to be circumcised. So their position was, we're going against what God has clearly shown <laughs> yes. us in Scripture That's right. if we do this. So in some ways, it's an argument about spirit versus Scripture uh, on the part of these uh, okay, uh, antagonists. John, 
Amen. Joan. <laughs> <laughs> I can't no. just say the first name. <laughs> Everybody's oh, on here named John. You can. Okay, go ahead. Well, there's not much more to add in detail except to simply affirm that it's a, it's a twofold thing. It's theological, isn't it? It's uh, also a f- f- having to do with, with, with culture and folk practice, isn't it? Um, on the one hand, there are clear injunctions mm-hmm. in Scripture, and on the other hand, there's what's uh, being revealed through this w- almost, almost willy-nilly spilling out of the church into the larger yeah. Gentile world. But it also has to do not only with visions, which are so important for helping people understand, but against that, what everybody just knew, in quotation marks, mm-hmm. was the will of God. There's a lesson there for all of us. We all just sort of know what God wants. But it's a question for them and for us. How responsive are we to God's surprises? Mm -hmm. Because God always reserves the right to surprise us. Mm -hmm. And there are not just theological, but very social implications of this right there. For sure. Because here, for instance, is a Jew who has become a Christian, still has a lot of non-Christian Jewish relatives, if you sit yeah. down and eat with uncircumcised people, you become unclean and you're not going to be able to sit down with your hmm. other yeah. relatives. They're going to now consider you unclean. And so it caused social disruption for, for them. Sure. Yeah. It's an almost irresistible question for me, um, Carol, and if I may ask this gentleman sitting just to my left. Uh, John Jones, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're the only person who's lived for years in another culture, um, preparing students to understand the Bible better and so forth. You must have faced similar kinds of questions. Everybody who goes abroad does now. We're a fortunate group here in that all of us have had a chance to travel widely, but, um, and I suppose all of us have lived at least briefly elsewhere. But uh, how does a, a missionary, as we've often called them, <laughs> decide that these people are missionaries in a sense, they go out, and it looks to me like they're picking and choosing which practices mm-hmm. you insist on and which ones you don't. Mm-hmm. Yes, Missionaries have often gone out and insisted on changing diet, changing days of worship, changing many things. Clothing. Clothing. So yeah. how did they, I, I'm just fascinated by this story, they, they have an argument over what you can impose really is the way it feels impose on these people and they mm-hmm. say well let's let's cut them some slack yeah now in our time wouldn't that have been called i can imagine some people <laughs> saying wait a second you can't take the the message of the bible to people at a discount you, you it's a whole story mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah T- well, talk to us about i don't know that. how many you want to take on that from <laughs> a long uh, time <laughs> <laughs> how many how many segments do we have here <laughs> well ju- you you have put the the issue very pointedly jerry by by talking in terms of missionaries going across cultures to mm-hmm. do this, and I'll, I'll say just a quick word on that, but then move on to internal within a given culture as well, if I may. And I'll try to make this brisk, I promise. But here we are. Uh, I was raised in Asia, kid who knew something about that part of the world. Uh, when uh, I went back to Hong Kong, uh, after having been pastoring here in California for a time, having done seminary and all that, um, got out there, felt at home in many ways. But here, within the first uh, 48 hours of my arrival, I went out with a fellow pastor, Chinese pastor, to a boat in which some of our church members were living. Now, this is a sampan. It's a working boat. He says, these are our our church members, the the Chow family. Mm -hmm. I went out with them, and uh, and, uh, here is this is this semi-chaotic scene on this boat, uh, ropes and, and everything everywhere, and um, the, the mother uh, whaling the living daylights out of a huge fish that's flopping up on the stern, and she's doing that, and the father is sorting out some fish from the net and throwing some back in, and there's an extremely poisonous snake there. The sea snakes are very poisonous. All of that, um, and, uh, and I, I, I took all of this in. And I remember standing there thinking, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm. What does this kid raised on granola and peanut butter have in common with these people? You know? mm-hmm. Well, after a while, you find out. <laughs> but in the classroom, 
to move on quickly. Um, when uh, we, we hit things like this chapter that John has set forth so clearly for us, um, our, 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 our Korean students, for example, were right in here. They said, that's right, it's a problem. Uh, we, with our families, should go twice a year to our ancestors' graves and clean them off and, and participate in the ceremonies and rituals. We can't, at least all kinds of misunderstandings, their tension. Um, and so much of what we read here just resonated with them, as you can imagine. Uh, to be very brisk about all of this, there are theological things and there are cultural practices, and it's difficult sometimes to tease them apart and know what's what, isn't it? <coughs> may I put this point in? And that is that circumcision, while we may be looking upon it these days in terms of culture, it wasn't culture, it was covenant That's right. back in the Old Testament. And the text of Scripture that is especially uh, important in this regard is, is Genesis 17. And there, God is talking with Abraham, and remember, the whole world is to be blessed through Abraham, Abraham. okay? So <clears throat> there, there you've got to have a, a connection with Abraham. And here he's given a covenant. Verse 7, I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. That sounds good and we love it. But then he says what this covenant is. He interprets what the covenant is that God made with Abraham. Verse 10. This is my covenant, which you shall keep. Every male shall be circumcised. And then it gets stronger as you go down the line here in verse 13. Uh, <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, at the end of that verse, he says, So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Yeah. And so now, so you got Abraham, the figure in whom we're all blessed, and that includes Gentiles, obviously, the whole of the Gentile world would be blessed in Abraham. And we have him being circumcised and God giving him an everlasting covenant. These folks had a pretty good argument mm -hmm. on their side, yeah. you see. And well, there had to be something that entered Paul's consciousness that overcame the largeness mm -hmm. of this. That, yeah, I'm just reading the words here that's, that are in that passage on verse 14, where it says, Any uncircumcised male who's not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. I'm sure no pun intended there, but uh, uh, because he's broken my covenant. So it's not subtle. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a kind of um, ostracism that's called for. Right. I don't know what else to call and, it. And you know what's interesting about what you just said, Jerry, shall be cut off, mm -hmm. you know? If you look at the book of Galatians, Galatians 5, if you Gentiles go and get yourselves circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And they are, in his words there, they are, as it were, cut off mm. from Christ. Mm. So look at these differences of perspective yeah, right. here. Can so, I give a, a little, excuse me, go ahead, Jerry. Well, I just, just to wrap that up, I suppose the obvious question is, what authorized them than to take such a clear teaching of Scripture. I mean, if, if you're Jewish and you've come into the Christian mm -hmm. faith, you've, you've just cut off an important part of the heritage, a very distinguishing part, the covenant, um, it's the signifier for the covenant. That's so right. I, I, there's, can't gloss it over. It's kind of a big deal. What authorizes them to do that? To me, that's the, the question. Well, there's a sign of separation back there in the Old Testament, I think between these people and those people. It was a sign of separation. Now, of course, Acts in the New Testament is saying there is no more separation. And so that sign of separation, that really we can look at that now in a new, in a new way. In a new light, that's mm. right. And, and to me, truth is progressive. Mm. And if, uh, if, if, if God mm. was giving a, a message to a certain group of people, in those days, and he was, and they, for many, many years, <clears throat> didn't seem to listen to God the way they should. And then we have Paul come along, and he's talking to the Gentiles. And doesn't God give them a clear picture, um, a vision, or a dream, or whatever you want to call it, saying, uh, uh, 
these people are receiving my Holy Spirit. And they did receive it. So therefore, are you going to go against God or are you going to hold the Old Testament up to God and say, what is this, which you said back then? And I can see where it would cause confusion. Yeah, yeah I think it did. Well, um, the answer they give is it's a, when, it, when the letter goes <laughs> out, it says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Okay, where, where are you reading uh, this? Well, that's verse 28. In that order. In, right. Yeah. In verse 20. This is in the letter, you know. Now they've, mm -hmm. they've made the decision. And they've so are got we to, still in chapter 15? Yeah, chapter oh, yes. 15. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. And, you know, the letter begins, greetings, um, how's it going, and so forth. And then we get to verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us okay. not to burden you with anything uh, beyond the following requirements. And then it tells uh, what they yes. still have to do. Mm -hmm. If they have to abstain from, as uh, John Brown already said, uh, from uh, food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meat strangle of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. I guess the fact that circumcision is not mentioned on the list was, by way of inference, all they needed to say, yeah. I think. And you will do well to avoid these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, it is a challenge because, in a way, you can... Jerry, you were asking the question about picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. We can even pick and choose within the sacred text as well. Mm -hmm. Here is, here is um, um, James, the brother of Jesus, standing up in verse 16 of this chapter, mm -hmm. quoting verses 16 and 17, which are drawn out of Amos, which prophesy that the Gentiles mm -hmm. will see the great light and will come around and join all the nations. Now, the, of course, the implication is with or without all of the ritual ceremonial uh, conditions applying. Um, but they're ready to cut to the chase here, but they validate it from the text, finally, don't they? And in verse 19, <laughs> is my judgment, therefore, yeah. that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Well, one of the reasons I raise the question, Carolyn, is because sometimes I've seen these bumper stickers I've never been tempted actually to have one, but I've seen them, and uh, I, I envy the certainty that uh, they represent, and that is God said it, I believe it, that's good enough for me. Or that settles it. Or that yeah. settles it. I've seen different versions of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine somebody at this conference saying, wait, it says it, and it, it doesn't mince words, uh, and that's good enough for me. Bumper sticker theology. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and obviously something more complex goes on here. Uh, it's that complexity that interests me. It's the it's the role of the spirit leading the people, and it's the it's the um, it's the responsibility the people take for listening yeah. to the spirit and making good decisions. Well, interestingly enough, <clears throat> the spirit is in Acts co-joined with baptism. So you have here for the Old Testament people of God, you have circumcision. For the New Testament people, we have baptism. Now, does baptism function differently than the Holy uh, than circumcision did in the Old Testament? Have we just replaced one thing by a similar kind of thing? It looks different, but it's still a concrete act, a rite. And now we've got baptism. See, um, or is there something about baptism that says says something to us? Well, it seems to me there are several differences between circumcision and baptism that makes baptism more appropriate for this new covenant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one is that baptism includes men and women, not right. just men. Exactly. Uh, that point. was part of what Paul said in Galatians that the gospel does. It breaks down the mm -hmm. distinctions, Good. the barriers yeah. between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. Another one is that I think as the early Christians and many of us um, consider baptism, it's a matter of decision. Whereas circumcision was simply something automatically done at eight days old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But baptism is a decision to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting to note that, that um, the death of Christ, which is at the center, of course, mm -hmm. of the New Testament, is called in Colossians a circumcision of his flesh. Christ has the mm -hmm. circumcision in his broken body, his rent body. There's another kind of circumcision. And I take it that one supersedes greater than the other one. So what was in the foreskin is now on the cross. 
And so you have something totally new here. And as John said, we have to be prepared to expect very new things. Somehow, on the one hand, we've got we just have the overwhelming evidences of, of these people. Um, they, they, uh, their preaching is blessed. They have the Spirit. There's all of the manifestations are there, even miracles. At the same time, sooner or later, you've got to bring it home theologically. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, all of the evidences and manifestations still are going to fall a little flat. And it's interesting that while the theology may not have been the cutting edge, it finally becomes the validation. You see in chapter 15, verse 11, that discussion, that debate that's going back and forth, we'll jump right in at verse 11 here. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Mm -hmm. In other words, on all sides, salvation is only one way now. It is only through grace. Mm -hmm. That finally had to come into focus, I think, before they could really rally around this banner somehow. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the key. Uh, what, what troubles me a little bit is the verse that comes just before the one that yeah. you read. Yeah, you notice <laughs> I, I skipped that there, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> now therefore, uh, verse 10, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples, that, that's referring to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. Mm -hmm. You talk to any Jew of today, why, they don't feel anything about the Torah or about circumcision as being a yoke that you can hardly bear. I'm just wondering, John, if, if when the grace thing comes into the picture so strongly, yep. it alters. Yeah. You, you see, you it see it a yoke way. where you didn't see a yoke before. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we continue well, on? I'd like to say one more thing. Well, I yes. guess we won't continue <laughs> on. <laughs> It, it seems to me that understanding this is very important for the church today. Oh, yeah. That there are issues mm -hmm. that I think are similar mm -hmm. today. Um, I think Such of how... Such as? Well, I think the ministry of women. Um, in the church where I've pastored for the last eight years, I've worked with three women associates, mm -hmm. all of whom I have seen incredible ministry where the Spirit is obviously blessing their ministry, where they have done just remarkable things to build up our congregation, mm -hmm. and God has worked through them. I have absolutely no doubt about it, and yet they are not able to have the same kind of ordination that men do. And I don't see any difference in the way the, the Spirit uses these women and the men. I've worked with men associates and women associates. And I don't see any distinction, and yet we continue to make distinctions. I remember the former, one of the former pastors of the Loma Linda University Church who said, you know, having women on our, fa our staff <clears throat> has made a profound difference. Yeah. We see things and feel things in a different way, mm -hmm. you yeah. see. Now, I remember once when I was at the seminary, where I taught, I was discussing this with one of the uh, persons on staff, and a very fine man, and uh, I was telling him this very thing that I mentioned here. And he says, yes, that's well and good, and then suddenly he clenched his fist, and he came down on a table, he said, but the word of God there you are. forbids it. Yeah, it's a word versus the spirit. Yeah, All see? over again. So that's, that, there we are. Mm -hmm. Although we should <coughs> say that that may be a misunderstanding of the word because I don't see of anything course, in the course. word that forbids <coughs> yeah. ordination of women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, of course, there, there isn't an, an, any, anything that could possibly even be interpreted that way is nowhere clear, uh, close to as clear <laughs> as the teaching about circumcision yeah, was when the right. church encountered this. Well, issue. you realize mm -hmm. there are people, though, who feel it's clear in Scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, they feel absolutely. Mm -hmm. Only men were appointed by Christ. Only men should be ordained. Nowadays, we're following the example of Christ. They feel very strongly about that. Well, I guess I like, <coughs> I like this story because 
to me, it shows the church willing to face difficult issues, issues that potentially, mm -hmm. I mean, if this had been resolved the wrong way, you might say, mm -hmm. oh. if the church hadn't listened to the Spirit, what do you think would have happened to the rest of the church? My, I, my prediction would be that it, it would have failed to, to go out to oh, the sure. world as it should. Mm -hmm. You would have had a Jewish church mm -hmm. and a Gentile church, and they'd be at odds mm -hmm. with each other. That's, I'm, that's clear. We're here today because they listen to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. Simple right. as that. That's exactly. Right. Okay, Jerry, would you read on starting with verse 30? All right. Please. Um, this is just after the letter, and the letter is ended sort of the way mm -hmm. we sometimes end letters with the word farewell. And then the story picks up. <clears throat> the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Mm. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. All right, and in Antioch, what do we remember about Antioch? Many things. Well, there are many things about that's Antioch. That's where first called Christians. That's first called where Christians. First, first called yeah, Christians. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and um, now we have about uh, thirty seconds left, and we're not quite to the end of verse fifteen, but we're going to start there next time. In the meantime, dear friends, it's good to be hmm. back with you. Don't give up. <laughs> we're almost there. Just hang on and we'll meet each other in heaven. And in the meantime, this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers. <laughs>